The Flora Wonder Blog. The cornice section at Flora Farm. The upper gardens at Flora Farm have been featured in my blogs before, for there exists a wonderful array of woody trees and shrubs. They all reside in a semi-wide state, which means that we mow the grass and water occasionally, but don't devote any other resources to their upkeep, other than my infrequent attempts to keep the inventory updated and accurate. But that is enough of a chore, exceedingly more than you can imagine, due to the lawnmowers, carelessness, or indifference, and to the possible employee misunderstanding as to just why those metal-labeled objects exist anyway. It, the collection, is my personal obsession, my pleasure, but it is understandable that my employees are more focused on lunchtime and payday and not to the accurate identification of my tree collection. But yet the trees do grow and thrust into the sky. They eventually crowd themselves and into the roads, and many receive a limbing up, so as not to require a half acre of empty terra beneath. In other words, you don't just plant an arboretum and walk away. This past weekend I spent a couple of hours amidst the upper garden trees. There are seven or eight sections above the house, all with identification names such as Acer, Abbeys, Cornus, Betula, Magnolia, Sciodipitus, Circus, and probably one other that I am forgetting. None of these gardens is planted exclusively with its namesake tree, but there exists at least one such tree in its respective genus. Got it? After the fog, the freezing fog, Eventually lifted at noon, I ventured into the cornice section of my collection with my college rule notebook paper on my cold metal clipboard and recorded the trees. I must admit that I discovered a couple of species that I could not recall having planted, but there they were. And nice to meet you again. Ah, Abby's can color what's Etsy I. There you are, finally. I knew you before I had you. My tree mentor, Dr. Forrest Bump of Forest Grove, Oregon, extolled your beauty in the 1980s when he visited England's Hillier Nursery one spring and experienced Watsetsii with his wife. She really wasn't a plant person, actually not at all, but she absolutely loved the chartreuse new growth on Watsetsii, especially displayed against the silver-blue older foliage. The con collar species does not especially thrive in my low western Oregon climate. It is just too wet for it here. But nevertheless, one of my Watsetsii specimen at 18 years of age continues to look good. Perhaps of some importance is that it is grafted onto Canaan fir, Albies balsamia phanerolepsis, a hybrid of the northern Abbeys balsamia with the southern Abbeys fraseri an intermediate which naturally occurs in the swampy regions of West Virginia. Just below the cornice garden is the Abbey section, which I featured in the blogs. The cornice garden also contains some true fur, notably a fantastic specimen of Abbey squamata, flaky. The flaky bar fur from Sichuan, Tibet border delights all who see it. The needles are a rich blue-green, and the cones are ornamentally purple. And when young, the species can attain a perfect Christmas tree form. The exfoliating cinnamon brown bark is fantastic, and I suspect that if I passed off some squamata trunk photos as Acer grissium, no one would notice. Abbey squamata is native to a dry region, and it holds the altitude record of all abbeys at 15,416 feet, 4,700 meters. Locally, it is known as Bolo, but then the Tibetans refer to other abbeys and Piscea species by the same common name. Abbey squamata is listed as vulnerable by the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species, but I can produce lots of them should you want to grow it. Hardy to USDA Zone 5. Another abbeys in the cornice section is Coriana Blue Cone Pendula the start of which came from an East Coast collector years ago. The cultivar name is on sound. Besides the fact that it grows beautifully into an upright pyramidal shape, 
with nary a downturn of any branch. I didn't feel that I could sell it at any size since it didn't weep, and so my original specimen was planted in the upper gardens, the perfect spot when you don't know what else to do with the tree. The same thing happened with a very prostate form of noble fir, Abies procera, that was labeled Glauca prostrata. The specimen that I grafted from was growing in my old Dutch employer's garden and was only one foot tall by about 10 feet wide at 20 years of age. All of the side shoots that I propagated from proved epically dominant, so it was yet another project that yielded zero profit. I'm happy, though, that I planted one of these blue nobles just outside my office window, and I removed the prostrata part from the label. There are a few Ilex aquifolium cultivars in the cornice section, and I love them greatly, although there is not a huge demand in my market. As noticeable and vibrant as any golden spruce or pine in the winterscape is night glow. My start came from the same Dr. Bump of Forest Grove mentioned above, for the good doctor had quite a collection of ilex in his famous rhododendron garden, and maples too. He discovered and named Acer palmatum tiger rose, which he named for his wife. Ah, uh, the rose part. Now in the 90s, Dr. Bump no longer gardens, and sadly he is now holed up in an assisted living situation. But he was very helpful and supportive of me when I began my career. Now back to night glow. As dusk advances, the plant really does shine, as if the daytime light was stored up inside. What a show off. Eilis aquifolium crossifolia is the most curious selection, with thick, small, dark green leaves with rude spines. Crossman, in Manual of Broadleaf Trees and Shrubs, decides that crassifolia is not attractive but unusual. There is a dull German for you, but anyway, I think it is attractive. The cult of our name is from Latin, crassus, meaning fat, stout, or thick, and folia is of course from the Latin folium for leaf. Another delightful holly is the dwarf pixie, which grows into a rounded form. The specimen shown above is about three feet tall by three feet wide in 15 years and berries nicely throughout fall and winter. Speaking of berries, how about the Japanese white beauty, berry calicarpa, japonica, leucocarpa? Tiny pearl-like fruits appear in the fall and persist throughout winter, and the bush is especially attractive when the leaves are out of the way. The name Calicarpa is derived from two Greek words meaning beautiful and fruit, while Leucocarpa is from Greek, leukos, meaning bright or brilliant, in a white sense. Even though the berries are small, they are born in profusion, and I thoughtfully place the bush next to my driveway, so I'm able to see it at least twice per day. What is barely noticeable are the pale pinkish white flowers in summer but that's a small concession compared to the winter show. I'm glad I didn't follow the advice of now ex-employees who suggested that I should grow only maples and conifers, and who detested little alpines, perennials, and woody shrubs that I encumbered my nursery with. Ha! Since his departure, we have blossomed joyfully into the other category of plants with no end in sight. The cornice garden is full of maples, and it's fun to watch the specimens mature. What's not fun is to notice that I'm maturing as well, for some large specimens have been in the ground over 10 years, when they were also possibly 10 years old when planted. So they're like my living diary, a constant reminder that there are far less days at the top of my life's hourglass than days at the bottom. A great tree, but with a horrible name, is Acer palmatum skeeter's broom, one of the more vigorous of the cultivars with witch's broom origin. When young, it resembles the well-known Acer palmatum shana, but in time, skeeter's broom will grow four or five times as large as shana. Both cultivars display purple-red foliage with the witch's broom characteristic truncated middle leaf lobe like the opposite of giving the finger. 
I'm happy to have a nice Acer Shirasawinum Johin in the garden, a buckled seedling selection from about 20 years ago. My Japanese wife saw the original about 12 years ago and remarked how elegant the tree looked. I asked her the Japanese name for elegant, and she replied, Johin. Haruko often has an artsy perspective on plants, much different than my concerns as to whether a tree can be propagated, grown to a good shape, then eventually sold. I'd love to float along with her and share with her relationship with trees, so if I ever become independently wealthy, I might change. Probably more interesting than my blogs would be hers, which would be titled, How Haruko Sees the World. Acer, Bujirianum, Mino Yatsubusa is a wonderful cultivar that can be grown in full sun. It is an interesting shrub or small tree for its long tapered center lobes. And it really takes to the extreme the species common name of trident maple. In autumn, one can encounter leaves of green, yellow, orange, red, and purple all at once on the same tree. In the Vertrees Gregory Japanese maples, Mino Yatsubusa is said to be rare in cultivation because it is very difficult to propagate. Even on Acer bugerianum stock, the same is said about Acer palmatum goshiki kodohime because of the lack of vegetative growth, and that the true dwarf will top out at less than one meter, three foot tall. That's news to my 10 foot specimen of about 20 years of age and the fact that I have 8-footers on my specimen availability. We have achieved over 50% on rooting Mino Yatsubusa in summer under mist, and regularly receive success rates over 90% on Goshiki Kodohime, also under mist. Don't forget that rooting cultivars is propagation too, not to mention those propagated via tissue culture has been said that I'm strongly opinionated in my blogs, and I guess that is true. On the other hand, I try to be very careful about how I project my growing experiences, as I usually don't have the final verdict. One is wise to qualify one's claims, and words such as perhaps and maybe are most useful. Also, use a low pedestal and speak with a humble mouth, because you are usually not as smart as you think. Thank you. All right, there are a lot of trees in the cornice section, but how about the cornice genus itself? Well, the oriental cornice kusas are the most prevalent, and I learned long ago that the kusa species was more resistant to the dogwood bane, anthracnose, a fungus that affects a variety of plants in warm, humid areas than the native cornice florida of eastern North America. And our market is largely in warm, humid areas of the central and eastern USA. The kusas come with variable leaf and blossom colors, and most provide exciting fall color. What's not to like about these neat little trees? Our cornice section features kusa, heartthrob, our introduction, summer fun, benji fuji, and akatsuki. Heartthrob is a vigorous tree with a round canopy and possibly the most deep red blossoms of any, at least here in Oregon. The flower of Benny Fuji is also very red, but the tree is much more dwarf, and it might take at least 10 years for it to grow 5 feet tall. Summer Fun is our introduction, and it features one of the most delicious white and green leaf variegation of any plant, and is certainly much more superior to the previously selected cultivar of wolf eyes. Nice name, Wolves Eyes, anyways. Akatsuki is also variegated, white and green, but not as pretty as Summer Fun. However, Akatsuki features flower bracts that vary from reddish to quite red, depending on the season. While it's nice to have reddish flowers on a white green tree, since they stand out more, the blossoms last only a few weeks whereas the vibrancy of summer fun lasts through spring and summer. In addition, summer fun is unsurpassed for autumn color. Okay, I'll admit it, that summer fun is the best selection of Kusa, largely because it is my selection. Goodbye, wolf's eyes. Hello, summer fun.
The sanguine species of cornice is commonly called the blood twig dogwood because of its red stems. But the Sangu Kaku like cultivar of midwinter fire is adorned with glowing coral red winter stems. The bush throbs with color for half a year, while admittedly is a non event during spring and summer. The genus name Sanguini is from Latin for blood red, but the midwinter fire cultivar is much more orange bright, and it absolutely glows with photographic backlight. I am reminded of the plant Sarcodes sanguini, commonly called snow plant, which occurs in southern Oregon to Yosemite in mid-eastern California. This phallic protuberance emerges in late spring at elevations between 4,000 to 9,000 feet in elevation. I first saw this ericaceous plant with a blonde girlfriend years ago, and we practically raced to the nearest motel to celebrate our discovery. The wild flower does not accomplish photosynthesis, but is rather in favor of a symbiotic relationship with the underground fungi. Such plants, my god, provide as much entertainment as any person or event. One never tires for the more you learn and experience, the more joy you receive. I'll admit that I'm a sucker for bio plants, which means of botanical interest only. And the Cornus Hossinervus is certainly one such plant. It is a small deciduous shrub with a dense, low-spreading form. The Chinese native is unremarkable for its small, narrow green leaves and creamy, white summer flowers, followed by tiny black fruits in autumn. Flowers are shaped in a cruciform cross arrangement and are presented in an umbelliform cyme in fluorescence. And the botanical term cyme usually means a flat top flower cluster which ends in a bloom that begins before the flowers below or beside it open. The cyme term, from French for summit, is probably one that neither you nor I will remember. The species name, Pasa nervis, is derived from French that from Latin, hocus, meaning little or few. And nervous is from Latin nervous, which refers to a fiber. But I must admit that I don't know where the few or small fibers exist on the plant. I'll research that further this summer when the plant is in bloom. The final cornice that I'll discuss is the hybrid porlock, which is a cross between Cornus cusa and Cornus capitata. And it originated in the garden of Norman Haddon in Portlock, England. In mild winters at Flora Farm, the reddish-brown foliage persists throughout the winter. But this year, many leaves have fallen, which I'm glad about because I don't find them attractive anyway. The hybrid is said to be hardy to negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit, USDA Zone 6. But that might be wishful thinking since the Capitata species itself is only hardy to Zones 8 or 9. In the low-elevation Himalayas, The dogwood fruits are edible by birds and humans, and it is known as the Himalayan strawberry tree. The Latin name, cornus, means horn, due to the hardness of the cornus wood. The species name, capitata, is derived from Latin, caput, meaning head, due to the mounding flowers and fruits. The cornus section, or any in the upper gardens, are not really traditional landscapes but rather a hodgepodge of trees and shrubs that I have managed to collect. Those discussed today are not necessarily my favorites, but every one of them has something to offer. Occasionally, I am talked out of a particular specimen, but for the most part, the trees are there for a long haul. I wonder if they'll be there ten years after I'm gone. A hundred years? Maybe I'll be up in the sky, hanging out with Flora, looking down on my trees. If you are a specialty nursery or boutique garden center wanting the rare and exceptional plants your customers love, register as a wholesale customer on BuckOltsNursery.com today.